Praise God, and he hope he comes. We're going to see him in the clouds of glory, and it's coming right around the corner. I mean, I feel it in my bones. I don't know about you, but all this stuff happening around the world just wakes. It's a wake-up call for the Christians, those who knows Christ, Jesus, in their heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. Days of Elijah. Righteous now. 
special prayer mat for the gallery and I. The King is coming. Oh, right now? He needs to be on a mic. At this time, uh, Naomi Weiss is going to give us a, a story. Okay. <clears throat> um, Just arrived. <clears throat> I read um, a book yesterday, a very short book, and it was about the angels helping people. <clears throat> and this one particular. Oh, okay, like that. Okay, big audience. <clears throat> anyway, um, it was about a little boy. He, he was four years old, and he loved <clears throat> he loved Michael Jordan. He just loved him, and he was always saying, "I'm going to go to Michael Jordan's house. I'm going to go to see him." So one day, a very cold winter day, <clears throat> he uh, he came in with his little basketball. And he said, "I'm going to Michael Jordan's house." and visit him and she said okay 
thinking, well, that's another one of those moments that he said that. And then later on, when she went out to get him, his older brother was about six. And he said, well, he went that way, Mom. And she went out on the street, and she looked up and down, and he wasn't, wasn't there. And then she called her husband, and he came home, and uh, <clears throat> they knew there was a big billboard down on um, um, King's uh, Avenue. And so they thought, he's going there because he thinks that's where Michael Jordan lives. And so they took off and they looked every street and up until they uh, got there and they looked around and there was no little boy. And they just, oh, she, the mother was crying and praying and said, oh, God, get some, that was around Christmas time. And said, oh, God, get some Christmas angels to protect him and keep him. Oh, God, oh, God. And she was praying and praying and crying. And so finally they called the police and they kept looking. And then finally on a side street, they saw these three women. Two were very tall and one was a little shorter. And the way they talked, it sounded like they were colored. And he was m walking in front of them and they jumped out of the car and grabbed him and hugged him and kissed him and the mother was crying up a storm. And the women were laughing and said, who's Michael Jordan? And uh, they said, well, I think he plays basketball. And they laughed and they said, we found him in a ditch. He fell in a ditch and couldn't get out. And <clears throat> they had known of a case where a man had done that and froze to death. And so they were so happy. They came along and pulled him out and then they were walking down the street together. And I guess they were walking toward home. So anyway, uh, they said, well, thank you so much. Jumped in the car and drove away. And the, fa the father stopped the car and said, oh, we should offer those women a ride home. It's cold out. And they turned around and came back and they said, this only been two minutes since we were here. They were gone. They looked in every direction and they could not find those three women at all. And so they were talking to the little boy and he said, well, I asked them who they were and they said, we're from God to help you. And uh, then later on he said, what's an angel mommy? And he knew, they knew that those three women had been angels. And I think that's a wonderful knowledge to know that God is alive and God is at work and he has angels and we have a personal angel that is with us also. So I thought that was a good story to share. Yeah. There is angels all about us, and God will send them. You just need to ask the Lord to help you through times that you go through. I know they were angels. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> the King is coming, praise God.
I just heard the trumpet sounding and now it's night the king is coming the king is coming praise God he's coming Happy faces find the hallway. Those whose lives have been breaking. Broken home, he has been so from here and free. Little children at the angel. Brother Gell, can I minister to us? It's wonderful to know that we can come to him and he comes to us. And there's a wonderfulness of his love in us. And boy, we got a lot of people gone today. But that's okay. Uh, this was just for you guys. It's about love, and that's a good thing to talk about while they're not here and different things like that. But it's a time that we need to understand about what is the purpose of the church. Of all the things he gave us was the word agape. We know that word. We hear it a lot. But we come to that point that that's the, 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 the marketing things that give us the strength where that we know that this is what God has for us. In order for us to see the purpose of the church, we need to see the way of having church. 
boy, everybody's got a whole bunch of ideas. You know, you want to have something that's fun. You just say, hey, we're going to choose today. We're going to vote on which color are we going to put the carpet down. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's got their own ideas in so many different ways and stuff like that. One time I went out and I just bought some stuff so that nobody had to argue about it because I'm the one that was paying for it and different things like that. But sometimes it just, as some people, just comes down in so many different ways. You know, it tells me one time about football, and there's not a whole lot of people that understand football, I suppose. But one of the greatest examples was a, by a guy that was named Vince. He was a new coach. He was the one that was going to listen to them and show them what, what their things were going to be. He watched the team practicing, and he saw that he could see everything that was going on. He then called the people to the side lines. He lifted up the ball in the air. He left those immortal words, gentlemen, this is a football. These are the yard makers. The outside lines out there are the boundaries. And then Vince began to talk to them about the basics of the game of football and why they were out there and why they would win the championship, and they did, surprisingly. He had a whole bunch of good people, but they just didn't know how to put it together. And sometimes that's the way it gets in our lives, is understanding to do that. And I believe that's what I want to do this morning, is to remind us why we come here. Why do we come here? And sometimes we wonder about those things. And sometimes we wonder, where are they, where are they today? And different things like that. Summer in Arizona. I don't know if she's in Idaho today or if she's in Utah. I don't know where she's at, but you know she's out there. And there's others. I don't know why they're not here. And some others are seeing their friends today and all. But we come to different things of why do we, when we come to church, why is our purpose? Why is it that we're going through all this? In Psalm 16, 11, it says, you make known to the path of life in your presence. That's what he said. David, I believe, is writing at this time. And he tells us that, that you may know the path of the life. and your presence, there is a fullness of joy. Do you believe there is at your right hand? Do you believe that there's a pleasure that he went on to say forevermore? Why is there joy at his right hand? Something is driving the church to be the church. And in 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says it the best. When it says, Christ's love compels. Isn't that an interesting word, compels? That he is coming into our life, a word that means that I'm hemmed in, that there's no option, I must not share that same kind of love and my own self, but to how we can press out love towards other people. I really like getting around my grandson when I get around him. He always wants to give me a hug, a good, hard hug. And he's always telling me, he's telling, I love you. And that's so important to understand that we as a church are commanded that we are commended for that we love one another. And every one of us need to do that. I, I wrote in my note down there saying, wow, because that is an amazing. That's what he wants us to do. Now, some people want to tell people what they should do and what they should ought to do this thing or be parts in these things and all the things begin to take place and all that kind of stuff. But God wants us to do something inside the church that people are totally wrapped up in the power of God's love and he comes into our hearts and our lives. And Christ, at his first coming, is going to hold the church and Jesus then is going to compel the church, compels the church to be a church that Jesus was building. I told one time there was this guy. He was about six foot six. He was a big old black guy, and he must have weighed somewhere around 350 pounds. I mean, I was a little bitty guy compared to him. 
and he grabbed a hold of me. He leaned me back. He laid a great big give a holy kiss. That tells you in the Bible, get, read him with a kiss. He did it. He gave me a great big one like there, and it stuck like a plunger, in, <laughs> and it stuck on my face. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I can't get loose. I can't do nothing. Now he's stuck and stuff like that. But know what he was? He wanted to tell me, I love your singing today. Now, that's amazing that anybody would even like that. But it came to that point that we understand. Now, you can hand out that other deal. I didn't want nobody to get, you can hand those other pieces of paper out to everybody. And you can help some spread it out. I didn't want them to figure out what was that about. That's just a couple of pages in my outline. And I want you to see this here. And there's five things that a church that was beginning itself, it took 18 people and they got in a garage. And in that garage, they began to gather. And they turned around and they came up with five things for that church. And that church is that it will be. And he wrote down a whole bunch of will be's and then he comes down to one will not. He said the church will be a church where truth is spoken together with love. He said, number two, they came together. This church will be a church where grace is offered to broken people by broken people. Isn't that understanding? It's going to hurt people or going to help people out there. Now, the third thing, he said, this church will be a church where the Bible will be taught in a way that you, would, that you could understand it on Sunday and what else? And apply it on Monday. In other words, you've got to do what you've heard. You've got to come to that point. It does something. I like that one when I looked at that. The fourth one is, is that the church will be a creative and a search for new ways to be relevant and help people that God knows where they are. And our message and our music will be designed to help people in this 21st century that we're living in. And I tell you, so many times we try to build up to where our singing is things that everybody will know something and everybody will get something. And that's something that needs to be done all the time. I really like listening uh, to Jim and he plays that the bass or with the other one, either one of those things. I can't even do either one of them and different things like that. But doing, a, doing it for the glory of God is a wonderful thing. The, first, the fifth thing he said, that the church will not exist for itself. It will exist for those who have not yet chosen Christ to their personal Savior. What does that mean by that? It means that if you don't get out there so that you're bigger and better than anybody else, just get out there and love them, continuously doing such a way. And we're looking at this great space of all the things I've talked about, and I've got two more to talk on. It's so important for us to say, God, what are you trying to do in my life? Now, they concluded with this, and now I heard them declaring it when I was sitting there listening to them. It said that the most important person coming to church will not be the attender or even the pastor. The most important person coming to church is the person who's accepting Christ for the very first time in their lives. That's the way we all need to be like that. And our first consideration is not for ourselves, but rather that we would take the time to think about the barriers that would stop someone from experiencing Christ in our worship. So the things they begin to pour out themselves, and i got a few more things I want to share to you in just a moment, but I want you to understand that we need to understand that we are here for us today to a point of creating space to extend God's love. Now, you know, I went to a church one time, me and Desi, and we were going to a church and just been there th three or four times, and we always sit, went and sit in the same places. If you see me, you guys like sitting in the back. I don't. I usually get about there, the third pew back, and I'm sitting there close. I want to see what's going on. I want to make sure I hear everything that they're saying. But then we were behind this same people every time, and they have you turn around, and they we called it a church interview. And they, it's like a commercial. 
and it just stopped everything. And they were just talking for the next 10 minutes. And everybody was just talking, talk, 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 talk. And they turned around, and every week they said, what's your name? I then introduced myself three times, and they still didn't know who we were. And all these different things. And I thought, God, help us where we can do what you want us to do. And as a church, when we come to the, to the church, we're compelled by Christ without options, but to share the love of God to everyone, all those around us. And that's to come to a point that we then create a space to extend God's love. Now, here they came down with some ideas that a church could do. And maybe we can do it. And good neighbor policy, it's giving gifts to the closest 200 homes that are around us. 40 days of community, voluntarily fix things in your neighborhood. Come on now. Invite your neighbor to your barbecue at your house. I know another one on that, but I'll tell you that but later, another day. But contact God's food and give it as to a food bank. And then uh, limit our consumption week food, electric, et cetera, and then give it away to those who are in need. And then community impact teams, seen in the communities, ministering to their needs. We need to come and say, God, how am I going to do this? And I think it's also very difficult in our lives where we keep our eyes on the outsides of the different things and understand that the church is in the community and we need to learn how to help people come to a point that we're giving ourselves to God and God gives it away to us and now the kingdom begins to alarm itself amongst all around us and that we are coming and saying God help me to be everything and never forget our purpose and that purpose of being a church and a person therefore then is I need to be a loving person this today have you been a very good person this today have you really I mean, have we tried hard at it? And we come to that point, we say, God, what are we going to do? Here's the word. It's the word why. We need to look at why we're here in this place. And maybe it's a good, it's good and that people don't know where Grome Avenue is. <laughs> this is the loudest place to ever have a church. It really is. When it was a dead end down at the end of this street, there was nowhere you could go. When I tell somebody, I'm telling you on Hampton Smartsville Road, you turn to the right as you're going towards Beale, just immediately turn. And I said, before you even blink, turn to your left. I mean, I have to tell them all sorts of details on how to get to our church. But I want to tell you, there's a lady down the street that every year she usually comes down and gives us something around Christmas time. And different things, she'll just knock on the door and talk with Desi. You know, aren't we supposed to be doing that to them and all? And finding ways where that we can care about our neighbors in a way that what we're doing and why we're here. And that God's got a redemptive plan that he has. And he's going to work it out in our lives. When you look in the Bible, you see there's a man named Abraham, a man who wanted God in his life. Those who had been doing our Bible readings, you found on January the 4th, on January, January, uh, Genesis 11 and chapter 12, you see that there's a place where God is introducing to us a person. He gives us the ideas about a man named Abraham, and we got some father, a home, a familiar surroundings. And God said to Abraham, he said to him, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. When was the last time you let God lead you where he wanted you to be? Where he wanted you to find somebody that's in our community. And then God told Abraham, I will make a huge nation that I can bless it and that you will be a blessing to the world. Wow. Okay. God was going to use Abraham's nation to show him his love. And then Abraham was moved out in obedience. And God made a community to grow in and become a great nation. How many of us would be a Abraham? How many of us would even do that and everything? We find ourselves in so many difficulties there. 
And suddenly life bloomed out. And the next thing you know, that God has blessed them so much that during a time of a famine that was coming, that it caused Joseph to be taken into Egypt. Egypt was going to be brought before the Pharaoh. He had the answers. He knew what they needed to do. And he became a blessing to Egypt from a little Jewish boy. And all these things began to take place in his life. And suddenly those 12 sons of Jacob, they turned into 12 tribes, and then they one day left Egypt many years later, and they come out, and there you see all these 2 million uh, Jews that are going out there that are going to take in place because of the re redemptive plan of God. Then the redemptive plan of God passed on to the, the nation of Israel, a nation set forth by God. It was there that God spoke again to Israel and reaffirmed the very same plan that was given to Abraham, now is poured out upon the, the, the nation of Israel. And they're coming out of Egypt. They're coming back into this area there. And they're coming before a place that God said, I want you to go to Mount Sinai. He takes them out there. And in Exodus 19 says, you will be my own special treasure. That's what he's saying to them. And he's talking to Moses at this time. He says, from among all the nations of the earth, for all the earth belong to me. Remember that, he's saying. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. He said, I'm going to do something again now. I'm not just going to save Egypt. I'm going to come back and I'm going to make this a wonderful place where it's going to be the glory of God is going to be in this place. And he was going to do all these different things in his life. So we know that the New Testament community comes to a point that God's redemptive plan is still working at this particular time. And God wants to send Jesus now to the next one. He sends us Jesus. And Jesus makes the tremendous difference. I've got a thing in our program that we watch. This guy goes through Europe or through Israel and he shows you pictures and it's really wonderful to watch this guy and if you ever come to my house, tell me. I'll turn it on for you. I'd love to watch it. Now he's got one that's going to, to the world. He's showing what God brought the churches to the world. And all the different things took place. And it's amazing what's doing there. But there was a time in Matthew 4, we see one day as Jesus was walking along the shore beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simeon, or Simon and also Peter and Andrew, fishing with a net. Jesus called out to them, come to my disciples and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and went with him a little farther up the shore. He saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat. And he called them to, see, to come to, to. And they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Genesis 12, there was Abraham. Then there came a time of a nation that comes out and he makes a bigger nation. And then it comes to a point that there's a fishers of men. He comes upon the people and says, I want to make you a fisher of men. When was the last person you won to the Lord? When was the last time you led them to that point? And Jesus came to the point that he passed on now that he wants this call to go. And he goes one more step. And he tells us that that point, that redemptive plan of God was going to be on the church. Somehow, some way, he was going to do that. A call to you and me that are here today it may not be very many, but the time comes for us to understand that God has given us the church. And in the church, he's come to make a way to where that God can do something in them. I just watched one of these guys. He was showing him. His name was Andrew. How did Andrew die? God led him all the way up to the worst part of what's going to be the Armageddon and all the things is going to go right up into Russia in all those different places. That's where he was led, and that's where he also suffered in death. But it came to a point that God used him. In 1 Peter 2, it talks about Abraham's and his community and who they're like and how Jesus and the church. 
But then Peter said this, you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests, God's holy nation, his very own possession. And we come to that same call upon you and me and saying, God, am I doing what you want me to do? And it came to a point in verse 9 that he went on to say, this is so you can show others what? What? The goodness of God. Have you done it lately? He called you out of darkness in his wonderful light. And God chosen us that we can come to such a way and the directions that he wants to do. And I may be a John Doe to a lot of people that are around me, but I got neighbors that know exactly who I am and what I stand for. There's various ones that are there that we need to be what God wants us to be. And the bottom line for the church is that God's plan is to bring people together in community to extend his love to be the, the world for his glory. And that's the role of God that's upon us. Let's look at Romans 1. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. What Paul is describing for us is that he's got a large community. He wants it to take its place. And somehow or another, he had to have help in what he was doing. And God laid upon him four wonderful things that we as church need to do today. And that we are essential, much more than you think. God can use you. God wants to use you. And it comes that point that as Paul realized this, he said, I need some helping in doing this. And God was saying, just remember, you're essential. Isn't that wonderful just looking at that person? You may listen to somebody and wonder if they can ever sing two notes together alone and stuff like that. But somehow God just comes into our lives and he wants us to be that kind of person, that we have a way of reaching out to them, but never stop of God's program, it's essential. We must do it. And that we are servants then in God's redemptive plan. And there's two kinds of servants in the Bible. There's the on-call servant, one committed to a job. But you see the 24-7, those are committed to God on a constant way. You may not have to do that. But God wants to use you if you'll just let him do that. But the thing is, we don't think we're essential. We think that we're not worth anything. But I want to tell you, you are worth more than you think you have. And another thing is, you're not better than anybody else. You are exactly what God placed upon you. I wish I was Raymond Hughes. I wish I was. But he was. And boy, did he have to do a lot of things in life and go through things that he went through. Paul Laverne Walker, one of the greatest preachers I think I've ever heard in my life. But one day he died. But you know what it's about it? I got a whole bunch of books by him. I got a whole bunch of tapes by him. And I'm not going to give up how he's already stirred me so many ways. Find ways that you're essential. Find yourself to be servant enough where you can be everything that God wants you to be. But then you have to realize this. We are chosen in God's redemptive plan. Every person who is in Christ is a set apart to be a part of God's redemptive plan. He can use you. Jesse comes around. She's got so many friends in this neighborhood. They all know her, everything about her. They probably know her birthday. They probably know our anniversaries. They probably know everything about us. They're wonderful people because she's a wonderful person. And she's able to do that. But what do I do then? If I'm essential, if I'm a servant, if I'm chosen, am I being a messenger? Am I? You've been working on your name. Your painter that's going to come to church here. He never has come, but one of these days he's going to come. Amen. And you're working on him. Make that message. Help him to where he can see somewhere. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, it says, Christ's love control. Christ's love controls. That means con 
compels is another word for it, us. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live, what? For Christ? Am I supposed to live for Christ? Am I been doing it? Have I failed it? Who died and was raised from them? So we have stopped evaluating our others from a human point of view, Paul goes on to say. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. See, what he's saying is we cannot evaluate. We can't come down to our points of views. We can't come down to the way that we're going to demand that it's going to be made that way, and that's the way you're going to be. I was going to tell you, I was going to share this later. I didn't know when how to do it. There was a man that was there one day, and he'd had a barbecue every Friday. His neighbor happened to be a Catholic. He turned around to him. He said, I've got to get that guy cons- converted. I'll see if I can remember this whole thing. I don't have it here. But he's telling me about there. He said, we need to get him converted to the Catholicism so that on Friday we can eat fish like we're supposed to eat fish. So he turned around. He got him in there, and they went to baptize him. And they said, this man was born a Jew, and he was in this and did that. Now we're, consider- we're converting him to Catholicism. He was so happy. And he turned around, he thought it was going to be made. But then on Friday, there it was. It wasn't fish. It was now a piece of beef. (laughs) He turned around and he made, if I remember how they said just right, he said they were praying over it. And they said, we now take this piece of beef and we're converting it just like we've been converted. And, uh, We now turn around and said that, you know, we were this and we were that. And then he turned around and says, and he said, this calf, he says, now you look like you're a piece of beef, but we now convert you into a fish. (laughs) He went on to saying things like that. It's just a funny thing to go on and stuff like that. I wish I had it written out here. But it's just wonderful what God can do. And he goes on to say that how differently we know him now, talking about those that are around us. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. And this old life is gone. A new life has begun. I want to come and stop and say this. On my phone, I refuse to take it away. It's there. Kavistad. He was a mean little guy that worked with me hanging sheetrock. But I can sit there and cut it and, and make it just right and get it to where we can hang it up. And I cut the pieces, and they hung them. And they just were just an ornery little thing, and it was always driving from uh, Medford all the way back up to they were living at Myrtle Point, Myrtle Creek. Is that Myrtle Creek is the name of that town? Anyhow, Myrtle Creek, where we were going to church, okay, uh, and different things like that. He wrote me down. He said, I want to tell you, I am sorry, but you made me a Christian. He made a conversion. And I just want to see him again. I want to come across him. And I keep it on my telephone to where I can't, I'm not going to erase that for anything in my life. Because I didn't think that guy was savable. (laughs) I did not really think he could. But he did. And he told me about it. So here's what Paul went on to say. He's saying to this, and all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people of sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, and God is making his appeal through us. So we're called upon. This is what he's saying to us. I want you to live for Jesus Christ. I want to do it, Lord, for your glory and for your reason, for your purpose. Somehow, some way to where that I can do it. When I blew it and when I haven't done it the way I should do it, somehow or another he comes around and somehow or another God brings his people back together again. What do we do? Our purpose then is that we need to read this, is that we are leading people to Jesus. We're following him together to change lives. That's the thing we need to do. 
and there's the five goals I sent at the end of your note is that this is the way I see life is that we need to honor Jesus and worship Jesus with our lives. We need to know Jesus and belong to Jesus' church. We need to grow in him and become like Jesus. We need to serve him, pursue his purposes. And these are, and then share him and reach out with his love. And what does he say to the Philippians in chapter 2? He says, shine like stars in the universe as you hold out to the word of life. So what do we do? Are we going to do it? I don't know. Are we going to? If you want to, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. They will like you. They will love you. Because why? Because you're going to love them. You ever had a few neighbors you wish they didn't live there? Right? Okay. Just give it to God. Let God do what he wants to do. Only that's all you can do. And all these things are possible. Of all the creating of spaces, I want to tell you, that's, this is going to be the hardest one you'll do. Because we got some things we don't want to do. And there's some people we don't ever want to be around them. Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you that if you keep saying that, God's going to lead you there, and you're going to hate every minute of it, so just give up and just win them to the Lord. Be a Christian in all that you do. Amen? Do you agree with me? I hope you do. And there's a few people here I wish were here today. But I want to tell you, we have got some wonderful people that are coming to this church. And they're just little bitty people. But God knows we need them to this church. And that's what we need to do is we invite them. We bring them. Father, we bow our hearts before you. And Lord, I sure know a lot of problems in me. I know that there's a lot of things, oh Lord God, that I think we all sort of, we're not doing good. But Father, you can help me, Lord, to reach like those people came up with those simple little things. They went from 18 people in a, gar in a garage, and today it's a church of 3,500 people in a little town in Grass Valley. But God, you can do the same for all of us if we'll just get it together. And that is so simple. Love, love, love. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.